want to come to you for a few moments this morning um, about a topic that's been probably preached on a lot, but it's been in my heart for the past week or so, especially of what we're going through. And the title of my message is called Living in the Rubble, Living in the Rubble. And um, I'm going to take my text out of Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And so if you got your Bible or your phone, your iPad, your iPhone, or whatever kind of eyeness that you have that you may look at, uh, bring that up, and uh, we'll, we'll read the Scripture together, okay? Bear with me as I pronounce some of these words. I'm not a Bible scholar. So the words of Nehemiah, the son of uh, Hekeliah, it came to pass in the month of uh, Chelshu, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left in the captivity concerning Jerusalem. See, God is always concerned with where you are and what is going on with you uh, in your life. He's always concerned about his people. And even as we're going through this COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, and, and all this going on, God is always concerned. He's mindful about every one of us. And they said to me, the remnant that are left of captivity there in the providence are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And these people were living in horrendous conditions. Back in biblical days, walls around a city was their, their protection. It was their fortress. They're, they maintained those walls. The, the walls were as, as important or probably more important than the city because with no walls, there could be probably no city because of raiders and, and the enemy. And then the gates, the gates representative places of prominence, places of entrance, places where commerce took place. And, and all that was broken down and all that was destroyed. And, and Nehemiah was uh, inquiring about these people because he loved those people. He was in a different place, but, but he was uh, still his heart. He physically was somewhere else, but his heart was there in Jerusalem with the people. And why they uh, why this happened was is because they had been in captivity for 70 years. Jerusalem had a, a thing about them as they uh, operated and, and lived under one king and one regime. They would prosper and do good, and then they would rebel and sin. And God, they would just go back and forth, back and forth, and God would, to get them brought back, God would put them either in bondage or bring something their way to get their attention. I believe that, that God has allowed... Uh, this COVID-19 to get the attention not only of America but of the whole world. See, this pandemic that's going on is not just a United States thing or a European Union thing. It is a global thing, and there's a shaking going on. There's a shaking going on, and I believe that when this is all over with, as we come back together, the ones that are truly wanting God and seeking after His face— Because I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to go back to normal. I don't want to go back to status quo. I don't want to go back to the humdrum, the one, two, three. And Pastor Diane and I have talked about this and and interacted with one another and just talked and bounced stuff off. And we believe that there's going to be a harvest. See, revival is for the Christian. Revival is for the the dead, uh, distraught, kind of walked away Christian to be revived. But the sinner, the lost, needs to be uh, uh, harvested and brought into the kingdom of God through the new birth uh, through Jesus Christ. So I believe that the harvest, I believe this is the last of the big time harvest that God's going to reap in all the souls before he comes back and takes us to heaven. And so it says, and it goes on in verse 4, it says, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. And I mourned certain days, and I fasted and prayed before God of heaven. Now, as I got to thinking about this story, I got off thought, how long did these inhabitants or these misplaced Jews and, 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 uh, that had lost everything and that had 
things stolen from them and their city destroyed. How long had they been in this mess? And I ask you, you may feel like some of these people, you may feel like some things has been burnt and broke down and, and, and the, the gates of your life have been destroyed and been burnt up. And I'm asking you, how long have you been like this? How long will you allow this to go on in your life because God sent his son Jesus Christ to make a way for you to come back so that you don't have to live in a burnt and broken down place and, and, the, and the gates of your life that is uh, destroyed. He, you don't have to live like that. He's made a way back for you. And this is what this day and time is all about, about people making their way back to Christ, back to the church, not the church uh, yes, the church building, this is, this is where we all come together once or two, two times a week, but, but we're going to come together. The true church is you and I as we go outside these four walls and we interact with people. Sandy and some of the girls were out working in the pantry yesterday and people were coming and they pre-box food up so because we can't allow anybody to come in with all the restrictions and the regulations that they have on us and so they was pre-boxing food up and, and setting them outside and people come and, and Sandy called me and she was so excited and she was crying she said we prayed for people people that has cancer we prayed for them and, and, and she said we've even led someone to the Lord We've even, I'm telling you, that's not a small thing. When you get the opportunity to minister to someone that has a great need in their life, it's time to minister. We minister to them in the physical with new to, uh, uh, food and substance. But then we also give them, give them the grace of God through prayer and encouragement. And so through this, we're ministering to people in all facets of their life. How long did the people that were chosen by God live in a state of confusion, affliction, and reproach? This sounds like a kind of a downer, but it's going to get good. It's going to get positive. How long were the walls in this condition? Let me ask you this morning that you are viewing online. How long have you been in the condition that you've been in? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you tired of being held captive by the things of this world and by the, by the choices that you've made and which has created a past in your life that everybody uh, judges you by and regulates you by? How long are you going to allow this? God says, I've come to, to set the captive free. I've come to bind up the hearts of the broken. I've come to make what was old and battered and, and tore down. I've come to make it new and rebuild it and make it better. That's the God we serve today. It's amazing to me how we can grow accustomed to the things of this world. We can grow accustomed to our surroundings and what is going on in our lives and, and, and the day-to-day -day rut and routine. And, and if we're not careful, we'll fall into complacency and we'll just go along to get along. And I'm telling you, I'm not a go-along to get-along person. I want something new and fresh and remarkable and exciting and, and surprising in my life every day. I love what Candy Christmas came here and ministered one Sunday morning to us and she was trying to get her warehouses up for feeding the people under the bridge in Nashville, Tennessee and she was needing a warehouse, she was needing fork trucks and she was needing palletizers and all this and, and every morning she would get up and say, surprise me God, surprise me. If we, ever, if we never have any expectation in our lives, we, we will never expect anything. We will never get anything because when it maybe tries to seek interest in our lives, we won't, re we won't realize it, that that's from God and he's wanting to do something. He's wanting to make a shift and a change in our lives. Complacent and contempt to accept the things the way they are and believing that nothing can change. And if we're not careful, we'll buy into that philosophy because it's been like that so long in our lives it's been like that for generations after generations in your life and your families it says and they came to me the remnant that are left of captivity there in the province are he said they're in great affliction and reproach the walls of Jerusalem are broke down and the gates thereof are burned with fire the walls of Jerusalem represented their strength the strength of the city, who they were. It was a defining thing. What's defining you today? 
What's your strength today? It represented their greatness, their greatness of a city. It represented who they were. And the Bible says that they were broken down. Has anybody ever been broke down? I've been broke down a time or two. I've been broke down. I, I, I've, I've missed the mark. I've, I've been duped by the, the devil and, and allowed things to come into my life that was not meant for me. And it, and it set up a captivity in my life. And it began to dismantle the wall of God that was built up in my life. And after a while, I began to feel like I had been burnt by society, burnt by people. And my gates, the entrance and the access and the, and the egress of my life had, had been burnt up. And it was just an open highway for things to come in and out that was not meant for me. Why? Because I had been broke down and my gates had been burnt. These walls also represent today for us damaged lives, broken dreams, dashed hopes, ruined opportunities, past failures, and insurmountable odds. I tell you, when this first, when this first happened, this uh, COVID-19, and, and they named it a, 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 you know, a, a global disease, and, and we were going to not be able to have church, I almost, the, the, the feeling and the oppression came over me this is insurmountable. Guess what? It was to me in the natural. But God has sustained us. God has been good to us. God has been providing every need. He's been opening doors of opportunity for ministry. People that, that we don't know has been getting in contact with us saying, I need you to minister to me. I need you to minister to our daughter who had lost a a boyfriend that she was getting ready to get married to, and, and, and they're distraught, and, they, and they, don't, they don't have God in their lives, and they don't know, but they're reaching out. Today, the world is reaching out to the church, not this physical building, to you and I. They're reaching out. What do you have? What can you offer me? I'm living in rubble right now. I'm broken. I'm burnt. I'm, I feel like I've been banished. I feel like the odds against me in my particular situation right now is insurmountable. Back in that day, their strength was gone, their greatness was gone, and who they were seemed to be destroyed. But not, Nehemiah said this, When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept, and I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before God of heaven. When's the last time you heard something that it got your attention to the point that it, you wept over it, you mourned over it, you took it to prayer, you even pushed back the plate, you pushed back some of the activity in your life, and you made it a focus to, to, to uh, make it a matter of prayer. And speaking of prayer, I want to encourage you right now, if you've got any prayer request. Please make a note of it. They're back there taking all these. And at the end of the service, we're going to pray over all these requests. Because there's a lot of need in a lot of people's lives. But we serve a big God that can make a difference in the situation and in your life. We serve a God who cares enough about where you are to make it a matter of prayer or to lay it on somebody's heart. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, it says... Then I said unto them, You see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lie, lies in waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall, so that there will be no more approach. Verse 18, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's word had been spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. And what happened was Nehemiah was over in a foreign land and he was serving another king at, at that particular time. But he had found favor with that king. And when he, got, when he got word of what was going on in his city, he knew that he had to make a difference. Somebody needed to make a difference. You need to make a difference in somebody's life this morning. 
You need to get outside yourself and outside your own conditions. Sometimes the best way to change your situation is to help somebody with their situation. Then when you lose focus of what's going on in your life, God gives God, you've untied God's hands to get involved in the affairs of your life. But listen to this. Nehemiah went to the king, and he, and he basically was saying, As king, I've received a report that my homeland lies in waste. The walls are broken down. The gates have been burned off. The people are just come out of captivity, and they are so distraught, and they're so beat down. They have no hope. And I got to go, king. I got to go minister back to my hometown and to my city and to my people. So the king asked him, what do you need? And here's what he said. He says, I need traveling papers as I go from here to there that as I encounter other kings and other kingdoms, they will see that I have your blessing of coming from where I am at to where I'm going and they will not impede my progress. It was called safety. He said, then I need, I need finances. I need money that when I can get there, I can hire people to cut down trees and, and to, to uh, build a labor force to help build up the walls. See, Nehemiah had an assignment. His assignment was, now this is a key point, don't miss this. His assignment was to go back and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. To make Jerusalem a great city again. The provision was not his responsibility. The provision came from God Almighty. So this morning I'm telling you, your assignment is independent of the provision. You say, well, I can't do my assignment because I don't have a means or a way or provision. If God gives you an assignment, he will provide the provision for your assignment. You're to go do the assignment, and God will minister. How many times have we here at Calvary went and got an assignment from God? And God supernaturally, we didn't have the provisions at the time. I couldn't see it physically. I tangibly, I I couldn't, it wasn't tangible. I couldn't get a hold of it. It wasn't in the bank account. But God supernaturally provided the provision for the assignment. And it's, that's what we call a walk of faith. It's not faith if we know we got uh, $100,000 in the bank and we only need $50,000 to do this project. Well, we can do that with our eyes closed. But what if we need $50,000 to do a project and we have zero in the bank? But we know we got an assignment from God that says, go do this. Our assignment is to go worship and do the, uh, uh, do the assignment. It's up to God to provide the provision. So, Nehemiah's assignment was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He had favor with the king. The king provided the provision, letters to travel safely, timber to build up the the doors and the gates, even even with his own uh, palace where he would uh, uh, stay. He provided guards and horsemen to escort Nehemiah back to Jerusalem. God gave Nehemiah the assignment, and he moved upon the king's heart to provide the provision. I say that's protection and provision. And God's still doing that today for us. He's still doing that. So thank God we can do it. We can rebuild the city, and we can start over. And as I was putting this message together this week, I thought about the rebuilding of America. This COVID-19, this pandemic has absolutely shut down the world economy along with the United States economy. And I'm just going to be real honest with you. There's some out there that wants our economy to fall and to fail so that they can get their agenda, the new uh, one world government and the new one world currency come in, the mark of the beast and set it all up. That's, what, that's really what's going on. And we need to pray for our president. I, I'm not pulling no punches this morning. We need to pray for our president. We need to lift him up. This is, I mean, he, this is stressful, stressful, trying times. And we need to pray for him. The United States is... 
we're right now just starting in a rebuilding process and it seems like everybody and everything on a certain agenda is fighting against the rebuilding. But I'm going to tell you right now, God is not done with America. God is not done with the United States of America. We're still that shiny city on a hill. We're still that beacon. We're still the money pockets and the money bank of the world for foreign missions and meeting the needs of catastrophes across the, the world. God's going to raise up the United States again. I believe it's going to be greater and better than before so that we can reap the end time harvest, not only in America, but across the world and around the globe so that Jesus Christ can... Uh, come back after a people that have been ready and prepared, washed in the blood of Jesus, ready to go in the rapture when he comes. See, we're building a kingdom here. It's called the kingdom of God. And Satan's building his kingdom. It's called the kingdom of darkness. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, you don't have that back there. Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus said this, not Jim Mullins or Pastor Diane, Jesus said this, I will build my church. When he said that, you can, you can rest assured that his church will be built one way or another. And he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Not only is Jesus building the church, even as Ezra built rebuilt the temple back in the day, but Jesus is also building his kingdom. There's two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of heaven, also called the kingdom of God, and then there's the kingdom of light. The other uh, is the kingdom of darkness, uh, and then the other is the kingdom of darkness, which is the rule of Satan in the hearts of all who do not know and worship God. You say, Pastor, that's pretty strong. It's, it, it's the truth. It's the way it is. It's the time that we start living in reality. Two kingdoms, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. You either love one or you hate the other. You're either serving one or you're serving the other. It all depends what your spiritual relationship is and if you're born again. The building material, now I want you to listen to this. Listen to this online. The building material for both of these kingdoms are the hearts and souls of humanity. Oh, I love that. The hearts and souls of humanity. God is going after the hearts and souls of humanity to build his kingdom. Satan is going after the hearts and the souls of people to build his kingdom. Who are you going to choose today? Which kingdom are you going to be involved in? Which kingdom are you going to participate in building in? God wants to take us and reshape us, fix us, and fit us into his kingdom for new life. Fit us into his kingdom for new life. Not that we fit the kingdom into our lives, but us fit into the kingdom. Satan wants to keep us in the rubble pile of sin. There was some surrounding governors and other kings uh, in that territory that was over other cities and one of them happened to be the name Sanballat you know, not, if you've been in church you've heard that you've heard that name and Sanballat asked can they bring these stones back to life from the heaps of rubble burned as they are in other words can these stones live again this is the question they are asking they're asking, can I ever rise up out of this mess? This morning you might feel like you've been burnt and broke down and, 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 and disassembled and you're in a, uh, your life is in an ash heap of, of what it used to be. And you've asked, yourself, you've asked yourself this week, can I ever rise up out of this mess? Can I ever find a place where I fit? That's, that's the big thing right now. Where? Where do I fit? Oh, I like going there because I fit in. I, I fit in. Everybody wants to fit in. Where, where can I go? Who will accept me for what I've got going on in my life and what has happened in my past? Where can I fit in? Can God ever use me again? Will I ever find life 
in that more abundant life that the Bible talks about? Or am I doomed to failure and fatigue? Are my best days behind me? I have all my opportunities come and gone. There's somebody that has asked themselves this question. I've heard a lot of talk. Has America's best opportunities already came and gone? Can America rebuild after this uh, economic collapse of where we had the best economy in the world and all of a sudden, like a light switch, it had to get shut off and now we are kind of feel like we're laying in rubbles? And people are saying, I don't know if we'll ever bounce back. I'm telling you, the United States will bounce back because the hand of God is upon the United States of America and other places, but I happen to be in the United States of America. I'm a red-blooded American, and I'm proud of it. The hand of God is upon the United States because it has played a central part in world evangelism and meeting the needs and the crisis throughout this world over since time began. Will I ever find life in that more abundant life? Fifty-two days later, after Nehemiah came to the city of Jerusalem, fifty-two days later, after they started, Nehemiah and the people who were willing to work with him finished that wall. Huh. President Trump needs to read this chapter right here because he's building a wall to keep us safe and keep us protected. Fifty-two days later, after Nehemiah started and the people were willing to work now here's a key factor are you willing to work are you willing to make the adjustments in your life that we don't go back as normal are you willing to make that adjustment are you willing to to say you know what in the past i've been a, I've, I've been a little bit slack i've let some things go it's the, it's the nature of our uh, our da- uh, our damning nature is to to do the path of least resistance and let some things go and slip Am I willing to to up my game, so to speak? 52 days later, he found some people that were willing to work, and they finished the walls. They pulled the stones up out of the heap, and they brushed brushed off the ashes, and they put the stones back in the wall. Can I tell you that's what God specializes in today? Finding people who are on the ash heap of humanity that have been burnt and broken down and dismembered and destroyed. People that have been outcast, people that have maybe feel like they've went so far that they can never go back. He specializes in pulling them out of the ash heap and brushing them off and making them a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus and putting them back into the wall of humanity and the church and says, you can make a difference. Or you're wondering about how you fit or if you fit, right here's where you fit. Because when I get done with you, it's going to be a marvelous thing. He says, Behold, I make all things new. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. See, we could go back even further in in history about these stones that was broken down and dismembered and laying in an ash heap. Archaeologists have found that stones, the stones in that wall were originally cut Here's, a, here's, a, here's an awesome point. you got to get this. They were originally rough, rough, rough cut from surrounding mountains and then transported by ox or mule to Jerusalem. In other words, when, when the stones were cut and hewn out of the mountain where they were found, they wasn't ideal. They wasn't, uh, I, they wasn't like going down here to, to the local brickyard and picking out this nice brick that's been tumbled and the sharp edges have been knocked off and, and they got a little lip on them for stacking. So they, yeah, It wasn't like that at all. Rough stones. There's been a time I've had some rough places in my life where I got hewn out of the heap of humanity. And after coming to the work site with these rough cut hewn stones they were shaped and milled to fit in their place this is what this is what the transformation is all about this is what discipleship is all about you were found as a rough cut hewn out of humanity stone 
You didn't have much shape. People looked at you and they said, I don't know where this person's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to turn out for them because they don't have the look. They, 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 I don't know how they're going to fit in. It's too big. It's too small. It's, 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 it's just insignificant. And after Christ brings you back into the church, into the sheepfold, into the body of Christ, through discipleship and through the, transma- uh, the transforming power of the blood of Jesus in your life, he begins through messages like this to begin to chip. Chip away. Knock off that rough place. Knock off this rough place. Grind this place. Grind this place. And before you know it, you are made for a specific purpose, for a specific time to be placed into the wall of the kingdom of God and his church that we are building to play a major significant role. Everybody plays a major significant role in the kingdom of God. There's no accidents. There's no accidents in God. Maybe you haven't found your place in the church yet. You're not sure you fit in. Well, I want to encourage you this morning, don't quit and don't give up. Don't you quit and don't you give up. God's not done with you yet. Don't walk away. Allow God through his word and messages preached to keep working on you. God asks, is not my word like a hammer? He's still knocking off some of the rough edges on some of us, and I'm telling you right now, weekly I get something knocked off me. Something something that's sharp, and and, and, uh, I I had to go, and I had to apologize to somebody this week because a topic came up, and I got a little little aggressive. I mean, it just kind of come on me, bam, just like that. And I had to go back after about a half hour after everything. I mean, it wasn't bad. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't a blow up. But I I was too firm and too stern with my response. And after I got back in my place here, the Holy Spirit began to deal with me and said, that's a rough place in you. I need to knock that off. Okay, God, go apologize. Go make that right. That's a hammer and a chisel that I don't like. None of us like to have to go apologize and make things right. Okay? Now, don't let that blow up in your mind. It wasn't as bad as maybe I'm making it sound. But it's, it's still something I had to go do. Okay? Whew. He's still knocking some of the rough edges off of some of us. And he didn't bring us this far to give up on us and leave us where we're at. He's got a place for you, and he will keep working on you and working with you until you, f- till you find that perfect fit for you. And I'm closing with this. But there are those who are not fresh cut from the mountain. There are those whose lives are maybe lying in ruin and whose failures and faults have made them Uh, a byword and a point of ridicule and disdain in their community. Anybody ever been talked about? Anybody ever been perceived wrong? Something get hung on you and all of a sudden now you're that? And that's not who you really are? Thank God for God. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God what he thinks about about us is the only thing that matters. They languish in the rubble and they melt into obscurity with no hope and no help. And there's some out there this morning that you may be watching right now or will be watching this later on. This applies to you. And I'm here to tell you there's hope. There's promise. There's a better tomorrow. There's a place where you can fit into the kingdom of God, into the church. There's hope for you. They've given up on life. And it seems that everyone around them has given up on them too. Perhaps, perhaps you're that someone or perhaps you know someone and your life is like that. Maybe it's your brother or your sister or your son or your daughter or a parent or friend. But you look at their life and you hear the echo that sometimes is still echoing thousands of years later from what Sanballat said, his question. Can these stones live again? Can these stones live again? 
And I'm here to tell you, yes, they can. They can live. You will live. You will declare the works of the Lord. So get this. As they was there during the 50-day, 52-day rebuilding period, with a trial, I love this, with a trial in one hand, a masonry trial in one hand, and a sword in the other. Why two? One was to rebuild, and one was to fight off anybody that came to try to tear down or stop or impede the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Today, folks, we must have the Word of God in our hands and in our mouth, and we must have the, have the trial or be out into the public sphere working and rebuilding people's lives and encouraging them, but have the Word, the sword of the Spirit ready to cut cut and sever any negative thing that might come our way. So with a trial in one hand and a sword in the other, Nehemiah refused to allow the scorn or the opposition of anyone to keep him from finishing his task in rebuilding the wall. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. What does God say about you? How does God feel about you? Keep moving, keep working, keep building, keep uh, allowing God to chip away the, the rough edges of our lives so that we become that nice stone that we fit into the body of Christ. If we are willing to work in the kingdom, if we are willing to take our stand on the wall and to labor for the master, and if we're willing to fight the good fight of faith on behalf of the fallen, then we can see something wonderful arise out of the rubble and from the ashes. God has got a great, great life for you. And again, if Nehemiah can go back and rebuild a physical wall with a mandate from God, then God can rebuild your life. And what might seem like ruins and might, what might seem like has went too far and what maybe you've done and, 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 and everybody's opinion of you is, is awful and horrible and, and you don't know how you'll ever get through that or get around that. Or if you, it's not your, don't worry about trying to change people's opinion. Allow the transforming power of God to pick you up out of the ash heap of humanity where you've been burnt and let, let, let the preaching of the word and, and messages like this, people to brush off the debris off you and then allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life and to make the changes in your life that you need to make so that you, so that you are shedding off those things that people perceive you as and let God allow, fit you into the wall and of the kingdom of God that he's building for his glory and for his honor. So we love you.